Good morning, Greenbrier family. So good to be back together again on Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but I look forward to Sunday mornings. It's just nice to connect at the same time. Uh, on the same day for the same purpose. Would you do us a favor, though? Would you um, add in the comments below where you're connecting from and who you're connecting with at this time? We'd like to say hello and greet each other. Also, now is a great time to gather your communion elements if you haven't already. Dave Scott, my husband, was responsible for gathering the communion elements last week, and he went high class, and he chose honeycomb cereal and Diet Coke. So tell us what your communion looks like today as well. All right, let's stand together and be active participants in this time of worship. All right, Calvin. Morning, Greenbrier Church family. Can we stand up together and praise the Lord? Who oh, are you are worthy of all praise? Oh God, you are able to provide all we need and more. And God, you are faithful. All your promises are sure. And God, you are mighty. Nothing's too difficult for you. You won the victory. Even the grace of means to you. So we glorify your name. We join with heaven and proclaim. You're worthy to receive all blessings.
God, we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. We join with every tribe, every nation in declaring your worth, your glory. Lord, nothing's going to stop us from giving you the praise that you deserve. No pandemic, no craziness that is going on in our world right now will stop us from giving you the praise because you are amazing and you are incredible and worthy of it all. So help us today to give you the glory. Do your name in Jesus' name. Friends, let's continue to celebrate the Lord today, our champion. All victory, all victory, you have won. Victorious. You have come, what was stolen, you brought back to us. Oh, victory, you have won. Victorious, you have come, what was stolen, you brought back to us. Our champion, you fight for us. You made a way where there was none. Our champion, you're strong in us. The dead we owed, you paid in blood. You paid it all. The one in who.
God, we thank you that you overcome everything. There is nothing greater than you. I want to read from Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who put their hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and walk and not be faint. Friends, there is so much going on in the world right now. A pandemic, a crisis in our country against racism, and so many other things that we as individuals are struggling with right now and in our own strength we're going to be exhausted. We're going to be wiped out. But as believers of Christ Jesus, children of the living God, we know that we don't rely on our own strength. We rely on the Lord God Almighty. And when we hope in Him, we will soar like wings of eagles. When we put our hope in Him, we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not grow faint. So will you join with me this morning and choose to put your hope in the Lord. Choose to wait upon the Lord. Choose to put your complete trust, your complete allegiance in the Lord because he will never fail you. He will strengthen you when nothing else can. So let's rely on the name of Jesus. On oh, Jesus' name, we'll break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name, above every other. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We'll break every stronghold, it's true. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Begin to speak his name right now. Jesus' name above every other. 
all hail the power of Jesus' name. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know, this we know. You promise never to forsake. What you begin, you will sustain. This we know, this we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. All of the heavens and the earth Now's the fullness of your word This we know This we know And every enemy And every enemy will flee yeah. As we declare your victory
Lord, we can't do this without you. We don't want to do this without you. Strengthen us, strengthen us even now. Strengthen us even now. Oh, even now you're renewing us. We're going to soar on wings like eagles. We're going to run and not be faith. We will walk and not grow weary. For you sustain, you sustain. I believe that right now God is sustaining us. I believe that he is giving us new strength this morning. Renewed strength today. When you thought you couldn't go on any longer, he is renewing your strength right now. He is bringing restoration where you thought there was no hope to come. Oh, he's making a way in the storm. Oh, he's bringing hope again. Oh, he's bringing joy in your family. Oh, he's bringing healing in your marriages. Oh, in Jesus' name, they will soar on wings like eagles. Oh, in the strength of the Lord. Oh, in the strength of the Lord. We will run in our growing. We will walk and not be faint. You're teaching us to trust you again. For you're the one who's worthy of our trust. Thank you, God, that we can put our complete hope in you. Oh, we trust in you. How high. How great is your love for me. Oh, I can trust in you, living hope. How great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. You're my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom? Such boundless grace 
the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has broken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation.
Thank you, Lord, that you are our living hope. Jesus, we find our salvation in you, Lord. And I just pray, God, that everybody watching this right now, God, would stand firmly on you. God, when times seem uncertain, God, that we would be more focused on you than ever. God, for wisdom and for peace, Lord, for our country, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Well, church, we're going to have our communion pause moment, and I wanted to read the word together with you all for this time. Ephesians chapter 2, this is the message version. And verse 19, starting off, says, That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. With as much right to the name Christian as anyone, God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. We are in because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We are no longer outsiders, but we are now insiders. And that's something to celebrate. That's something to shout from the rooftops. That's something that you want to tell everybody you know, that you are now in. That's what Paul wanted these people to understand. It's not about us getting it right. It's us grabbing a hold of what he did for us. So during this communion pause moment, let's take time to reflect on that together while we pause. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that I am in because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Lord, I pray that everybody watching this right now, God, would feel that inclusion, the community, God, the church as a whole, not a building, Father, but a group of people moving forward together with you, Father. I pray that everything we do would honor you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Now leading us in communion is Brent Van Norman. Brent, will you come lead us? Good morning, Greenbrier family. I don't know about you, but a few years ago, I was definitely looking forward to the year 2020. And maybe you went to some of the same conferences I did on 2020 vision, where companies would put out long-term plans. I wonder how many of them have in their plans. In fact, I would bet none of them have in their plans what happened to us in 2020 and where we are today. It really makes the, the, the uh, Proverbs 16, 9 come to life for me, which says, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. All those long-term plans where we planned our course are no longer really relevant for us. It's different times. Who would have thought 2020 would be filled with so many serious issues, so many problems? And yet, there's a sense in which we shouldn't be surprised by that. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have peace trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. A couple things to note in that. First of all, it is in me, Jesus says. It's being in Jesus is where we find that peace. And then the fact that despite the troubles that we face, Jesus is saying, I have overcome the world. The kingdom of God is greater than any kingdom in this world. In Matthew eleven twelve, 12, Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. The kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. But how should we describe the kingdom of God? Jesus asked the somewhat rhetorical question in Luke 13, verse 18 through 21. Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Verse 20, and again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. You may feel a bit overwhelmed right now, and you may be thinking, how can I solve the world's problems? But fortunately, we don't have to. You see, we're not called to be the Messiah. Jesus already did that for us. We are merely called 
to do small things, things that you might compare to a mustard seed or a little bit of yeast, and know that God can multiply those small things in his kingdom. I think of the five loaves and two fish that Jesus multiplied, and it fed 5,000. I think of the widow's mite who came, and Jesus said in her giving, she gave more than everyone else. You see, God can take those small things, the little things that we might think are insignificant, but in the kingdom can make a big difference. When we take the elements, I'm reminded of that as well. When we take the bread, it reminds me that I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm part of the body of Christ. And it may be a very small element. The bread we take may be very small, but it's very powerful and, and has meaning beyond just the, the actual element that we're taking. So would you join me? On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ broken for us. In a similar way, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me, the blood of Christ shed for us. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your promise that when we are in Christ, we can know peace. And Lord, I pray that each of us would recognize that your kingdom is so vast that you have overcome the world. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us as members of the body of Christ, that we would do our part. And Lord, we just pray that you will take our human efforts, and you will multiply them over and over so that your kingdom will be glorified and that we can see your kingdom be manifest in our world. Lord, we're so thankful for the promise of this, and we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now would you welcome back Kim Scott. Thank you, Brent. Good morning, church. Again, now we're going to move on to tithes and offering. As you are well aware, we have a few options that you can use to give. You can text, you can go online, or you can mail your check to Greenbrier Church, 1101 Volvo Parkway, Chesapeake, Virginia, 23320. While you prepare your gifts and your tithes, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Paul says this. He says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will resolve in thanksgiving to God. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us beyond measure. I know that if each of us here at Greenbrier were to sit down and write down all of our blessings, we would simply run out of paper. Lord, help us to see these blessings as an opportunity to bless others and to be generous to those around us. Lord, we love you, and with grateful hearts and in faithful obedience, we give you our tithes and offering today. In your name we pray, amen. All right, God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. He always gives good gifts, and he's always for our good. Amen. Now we're going to take the next 120 seconds to talk to each other in the comments section. For your icebreaker today, um, I think we can all agree that it's hard to find things these days that we all agree on. I mean, just look at Facebook, right? But at the Scott House, there is one thing that we unanimously agree on, and it's apples. And it's that the Honeycrisp apple is the best apple in the whole wide world. Am I right or am I right? If you're not putting Honeycrisp apples in your grocery cart, you are missing out on a little bit of heaven right here on earth. I would say the second running runner up for an apple, the best apple would be the Red Delicious. And my least favorite is the Golden Delicious, which is kind of unfortunate because that was a staple in my grandparents' house growing up. But you know what? I'm a grown up now and I can buy my own apples and I choose to buy Honey Crisp apples. So comment in the section below and let us know what is your favorite apple and let me know what your least favorite apple is. All right, see you soon. My favorite apples. I like apple pie. I like apple turnovers, apple muffins, apple bread. I like all kinds of apples. Actually, I like Pink Lady, and I like Fuji. I kind of agree that Golden Delicious are on the bottom. So, but anyway, in general, 
I like all kinds of apples. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. I don't know if that's true, but I eat apples anyway. Well, hey, I'm so excited to be here. Privileged to be in his presence with you and to learn some really powerful truths from God's word. I'm so grateful that in challenging times, we have the strong arm of the Lord to lean on and the wisdom of his word to guide our path. I don't know about you, but when this pandemic hit, it rattled my cage a little bit. I, I was unsure what would come next, but it did seem like my world all of a sudden got uncertain. On a deeply personal level, I had just taken maybe the biggest faith step that I have ever ventured out in my entire life, and this seemed to turn everything on its head. I battled discouragement, despair, maybe even a little bit of depression. I got emotionally really weary. I even shed a few tears. It's like I got sucker punched by the devil. Have you ever been there? Just something knocks you unexpectedly off. Maybe the pandemic didn't do that, but some other kind of life circumstance did that to you. So I decided I had to get out of it. So to remedy the situation, I went into a self-imposed quarantine. I call it 31 days with God and a battle general. I dug in 31 days, God, and the book of Joshua. I did it for no other reason than a personal need to survive. I gritted my teeth. I determined that God has something for me and that Joshua had something for me, something I needed so that I could get past where I was to the next place that God had for me. And I have to tell you, I found some answers. I found answers from God. I found answers from the battle general. I found out a lot of things about me. But most importantly, I found my way back on really firm, solid ground. That's what I want to share with you. I put together this series of messages called Transitions to help you not repeat my mistakes. I don't want you to trip up where I did. And I want you to get the tools you need so that you can navigate through really uncertain times. Yesterday was the pandemic. Today, our world's filled with violence, with, with uh, racism, with protests, with arguments. Tomorrow, who knows? The only thing I know for sure is that if we'll get with God and really dig into his word, there is a way forward. So let's start out this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your presence. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that no matter how we feel, how uncertain things may seem around us or unstable things might be under our feet, you are sure, you are our rock, you are our refuge, you are the confidence that we can stand on. You actually lead us and guide us into good places. And so in this moment, help us to listen, to learn, to lean in on you, and to allow you to transform us. Open our hearts right now, wherever we are, so that we can really be changed by your spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Well, have you ever noticed that the best plans of yesterday don't fit today? That great philosopher Mike Tyson okay he was a boxer he said everyone has a strategy until they get punched in the face isn't that the truth we feel like it's all laid out we got all the plans we're gonna do all this and then boom something happens to us and it doesn't go so well this message is for all of us who are facing something really different today and outcomes that we did not expect and things that are uncertain at best and unknown and our guide is a battle general, and I want you to meet Joshua. So Joshua started out in an introduction to us in the Old Testament as an assistant to Moses. He was one of two spies that he saw things God's way and not from fear around him. He, 
he didn't cower in fear. He actually came back to Moses after his short-term spy trip into the promised land, and he came back and said, we're ready to face down the giants. The only other thing we know about Joshua when we get to the book with his name on it is that he had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years with Moses, and he loved to linger in God's presence. So the story opens up in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And as I read through it, these are the things that stood out to me. Just re, really quick, kind of recapping the story. Right off the top, God and Joshua are having a conversation. It's like two people who actually know each other. Would that be awesome if our conversations with God were like he knew us and we knew him? And the Lord tells Joshua that Moses had died. He died up on a mountain and no, no one saw it. And so the revelation came from the Lord. And then he says, now it's your turn to lead the people. I want you to cross the river Jordan and take the promised land. Okay, put this in my words. Start with the impossible, then dispossess the evil, destroy the enemy. No big deal, rookie. You can do this. It's like impossible. So... I know you've been the backup quarterback your whole life, Joshua, but you're starting quarterback and it's the Super Bowl. Go. He goes from being out of the limelight to leading two and a half million people. And then God continues in this, this conversation. He gives the same promise guarantee that he gave to Moses. Literally, he says, well, I'll read it. Wherever you set your foot, You'll be on the land I have given you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you like that. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. And then God says, be strong and courageous again. Little clue here, this is not going to be easy for Joshua. But he says, don't deviate from the instructions and you'll be successful. Study the manual and obey it. Then one more time, God says, be strong and courageous. You start thinking, Joshua, what's your problem? How come all of, every few lines in these verses, God's telling you that you have to be strong and courageous? Are you a wimp and a coward? Or are you going to face something so terrifying that you need the mighty power of God behind you? I vote for number two. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I can't tell you how many times in these 31 days I read those verses over and over and over. I read the whole book of Joshua a couple times. But these verses were like the bedrock of where I began. So, I picked up four lessons. I want to give them to you. Here we go. Lesson number one, learn to wait on God. That means you have to devote extra time to him. Waiting on God means that we have to yield our terms and our timetables to God. I'm going to say that again. Waiting on God means that we yield our terms and our timetables to to God. We dive into his presence and trust. Now there's an alternative. You could come up with your own plans. You just think about that for a moment. God's plans or your plans? Let's go with God's. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to learn to wait. Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. There it is again. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Why, why are we saying that it takes bravery and courage and boldness to wait? Because our inclination is to try to do things ourselves. And God wants us to be patient so that he can start moving in on our behalf. Psalm 130, verse 5. In the NIV, it says this. I wait for the Lord my whole being waits and in his word i put my hope i love that verse i'm pretty good at kind of 
half waiting on God. You know, like I wait in my heart, but my mind's still working. Or I wait in my mind, but my heart's still working. Or I kind of half cock thinking I'm waiting, but not really waiting. I'm not all in. And this waiting is giving up my terms, my timetable, and saying, God, I want to wait on you. So how did Joshua learn to wait? He habitually spent extra time. Now here's a little verse that helps us understand that. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Wouldn't you love that? Afterward, Moses would return to camp. Had work to do. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Joshua spent extra time in God's presence, more than required, more than necessary. He was waiting. He was learning just to be there, to enjoy the moment, to capture the essence of who God was and to learn to wait on God with extra time. I have to personally tell you that I'm not very good at waiting if I have to give up my term and my timetables. Like, if I need to wait on God within my own terms, like next five minutes or maybe tomorrow, I'm good. I don't have any problems. But when God says, I want you to wait on me now, trust. I'm in charge of the terms. I'm in charge of the timetable. That is where I had to go with the battle general and with God. I needed to learn to wait at an entirely different level. Here's the second lesson. Listen for his voice. To do that, you need quiet space. Remember Samuel, little boy? His mom gives him to the temple to learn to be with God. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, God speaks to Samuel. He doesn't know who it is. He goes to Eli, the guy who's in charge of the temple. Eli hasn't heard God's voice either. I don't know. I didn't call you. Go back to bed, boy. Second time. Third time, all of a sudden, Eli realizes, hey, this could be God. Go back the next time you hear something. And when you hear it, then you say, speak, your servant's listening. So sure enough, verse 10, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. God isn't in a hurry to speak to you. He's patient. Because he wants your undivided attention. He wants you to get to the point where Isaiah 30, 21 is a natural thing for you. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Listening for his voice requires turning down the noise around you and finding a quiet space. We should know the God who answers and the God reveals more than the details of the problem that we face. We should know more about the God who answers and the God who reveals than we do the details of our problem. Now, I can tell you from personal experience, I'm somewhat of an expert at studying the details of the problem. I like to get into it. Sometimes I get lost in it. I like to look at different sides. I mean, even now in our own country, we've got one side pitted against the other side talking about a human solution to a spiritual problem. The only solution to a spiritual problem is spiritual. Yet I get fascinated at the arguments between one fleshly response and another, and that never solves it. We need to Listen to the God who answers and to the God who reveals. Quiet space means not just finding a chair or a closet. It's finding time and turning the other noise down so that the only voice you're listening to is the one who reveals and the one who answers. Here's the third lesson. Study his intent, or you could say, eat this book. Now, if you served our country in the armed forces, you know about this, but for the rest of you, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. 
the commander in chief and every general or admiral has what's called the general's intent or the commander's intent. It's not a detailed tactical manual, but it does include the general direction and purpose of the battle at hand. It's called the commander's intent, and it also includes the rules of engagement. So it doesn't necessarily have an answer for every specific thing that a soldier might come across, but it does have the background so that when the soldier meets something unknown, he has something to pull from in order to make a wise decision. The rules are there so that you know when victory is achieved. Now, in this story between God and the battle general, God and Joshua, that I'm watching for 31 days, the instructions are clear. Eat the book. Now, we don't normally talk like that. I'm not literally asking you to eat your iPhone or your iPad, or if you're old school like me and you have a printed Bible, to rip pages off and eat them. What this is saying is meditate digest let it become a part of you god said to ezekiel eat the book god said to john the revelator in revelations 10 eat the book meditate it day and night have it become a part of you psalm 86 verse 11 says it this way teach me your ways O lord that i might live according to your truth grant me purity of heart so that i may honor you psalm 33 verse 4 for the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. How do you know that you can trust God to get you from where you are to the place you need to be? By eating the book, by spending more time than you do right now digesting his word. So you know his intent, so you know his purpose, you know his heart, you know his motives, you know what he's about. And when God in this battle general at the beginning conversation, he was telling him a couple of things. He was saying, be bold, be courageous, be brave. I'm going to give you all of these things. I'm going to take you and give you the promised land. You're going to cross the river Jordan. If you've never seen a bridge before, you're going to dispossess or destroy evil. You're going to eradicate the devil and demonic from this land. I'm with you. Go for it, Joshua. By the way, your soul food is my word. Eat it. Digest it. Meditate. Make sure that the most powerful nutrition you have for your soul and your spirit is the word of God. Here's lesson number four. Follow all the instructions. Now, if you're like me, you glance at instructions. Like I get a new tool or uh, even a new like a new kitchen appliance i figure i don't need the instructions i can make this work i really only look at instructions once what i thought would work isn't working now i know not everyone's like that you know some people they look at all the instructions they're just better than me i have a tendency to shore up what i think is a gap by glancing at the instructions and I have to honestly tell you that if they're in like Russian, Spanish, English, uh, German, like, you know, some of these instructions that you get, I just figure, how hard can it be? It's in eight languages. I mean, I can figure this out myself. And I have a tendency not to read the instructions. That's not what God says. God says, I want you to follow all the instructions. This is the magnificent obsession of your life is not to apply certain things to help you it's to leave everything and find life the only way you can cross your jordan rip out the evil around you defeat the devil destroy the influence of the demonic and take the promised land of the destiny that god has for you right now is to have one magnificent obsession and that is to wholeheartedly completely Follow hard after Jesus. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father 
who's in heaven. Here's my prayer phrase. Not everybody who can sing like Pastor Calvin or prophesy or quote scripture or memorize certain books or sound spiritual makes it in. The only people who get in are the people who do what God says. And that requires this magnificent obsession, being obsessed about being fully obedient to the instructions of God. We'll learn in a, in a, a couple weeks what happens if you don't follow all the instructions. The consequences are devastating. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anybody wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, I have no idea why, but in third grade, I was in children's church, looked a lot like power kids, big group, small group. We had a Bible memorization contest. And whoever memorized the most verses won. I'm slightly smarter than the average person, so I went home and asked my parents that day, can you guys give me a list of the shortest verses in the Bible? Because I figured the least I had to memorize were the most verses I would win. Jesus wept is the shortest. Then there's Remember Lot's Wife. And then there's a few with five or six. And so that first uh, Sunday, these guys are memorizing all of these verses and, you know, like paragraphs. And I just got up and said, Jesus wept. Remember Lot's Wife. And at the end of the first week, I was tied for first place because I had all the short, meaningless verses. And afterwards, my Sunday school teacher, she gave me some encouragement. Let's put it on mildly. And she said, could you memorize some real verses, ones that are personally meaningful? And at the time, I thought, uh, the ones I gave you are meaningful because I'm going to win. But I didn't really understand. She meant something that would change you. I went home and memorized Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And I can tell you, that is one of my life verses. I want to turn away from every single thing except the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to follow him. I want to pick up my cross. I have this one magnificent obsession to follow hard after God. And the more I do it, the more joyful I am. The more I do it, the more I find firm foundation in perilous times. The more I do it, the more confident I am that God will rescue me because his word is true and I can trust him. Well, next week, I'm going to talk to you more about how to apply this lesson of following all the instructions. But I want us to turn our attention back to our first response to the what now. So we're going to do that just by looking at this key thought, all right? I'm going to read it the first time, and then I want us to say it together. Today, I'm stepping away from the distractions of the world and toward my Savior. As I wait for him, I'm learning to listen for his voice and to study his intent. Breakthrough and victory are on the way. All right, here we go. Let's say it together. Today... I'm stepping away from the distractions of the world and toward my Savior. As I wait for him, I'm learning to listen for his voice and to study his intent. Breakthrough and victory are on the way. I want to pray for you right now, but I just want to have a quick conversation between you and me. No one else that you're with, family, friends, coffee shop, in a car, wherever you are, I just want to have a quick conversation with you. If your world feels like it got turned upside down, I know exactly how you feel. If you have a hard time figuring out what day it is, so do I. If you're not sure what the next move should be, I'm with you. But I can tell you that my 31 days with God in a battle general got me on the right steps. And if you will apply the things that we talked about and start living out what we just confessed, that we're going to turn from the distractions toward our Savior, we're waiting, 
We're learning to hear his voice. We're studying his tent. God's going to bring you to breakthrough and victory. And if that's you, I want you to pray with me right now because we're going to believe God for a miracle that happens at this moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for reaching down into our world. Sometimes we're confused. We don't know where to go. And in those moments where we allow the circumstances around us to paralyze us, you break through with revelation and you say, be bold, be brave, be courageous. I've given you the land. I want you to cross into a new place you've never been. I want you to get rid of evil. I want you to destroy the power of darkness. I want the demons to break, their bondage to break. I want chains to fall. And I want the name of God to be lifted up. And our first response is, me? Now? And then you just say, I want you to wait because what I have for you is so much better. So God, here we are. Our world just got turned upside down and you're speaking to us like you spoke to Joshua. Wherever we put our feet, you're going to give us that territory. Whatever we speak in according to your word, you're going to mold us into that kind of person. You're asking us to lead our families, lead our peers, lead our friends in our world that looks chaotic and uncertain, we turn to the only thing certain, and that's you. And we say, we want to hear you. We want to follow you. We want breakthrough and victory to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for praying with me. I'm believing that victory is coming to you. Okay, Kim, come and tell us what's happening at Greenbrier. Announcement time. All right, Movement Youth, make sure that you are staying connected with Pastor Justin via text messages. If you are not getting text messages from Pastor Justin and you would like to, you can text MOVE to 757-302-8847. So you would text M-O-V-E to 757-302-8847. And don't forget that tonight you are having an in-person meetup right here at church during the drive-in service. And you're going to be seeing some new faces as the rising sixth graders will be joining you. So be nice to them. <laughs> Drive-in worship service is tonight at 6 o'clock. I think we can all agree, in addition to honey crisp apples being the best apples, that these drive-in worship services are amazing. So you don't want to miss out. Bring your chair, bring a blanket, or sit in your car. Just stay six feet apart from each other. All right, dad jokes. Dads, this is your final call to turn in your awesome jokes. You have until 5 o'clock today to email those to kennacrib at info at greenbriarchurch.com. I am really counting on you turning in these jokes. I'm really looking forward to it, so please make them nice and corny because that's how I like it. If you need an incentive to do this, the word on the street is that there is a prize involved, so make sure you turn those jokes in. Church at the Beach. Everybody mark your calendars for July 5th. That's when we will be having our Church at the Beach. Uh, we will be, it'll be located at the 31st Street stage in King Neptune Park, and there will be water baptisms immediately following the service. There will be lots of opportunities to volunteer, so please stay tuned to your email inbox and volunteer. Uh, make sure you are tuning in on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock for our time of prayer and worship, as well as Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. sharp. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for my Greenbrier family. Thank you for the healing that I know is coming for the division that is in our country. Thank you for restoring our economy. And thank you that at the end to the coronavirus is in sight. Thank you that you are the one constant that we can depend on whether we are in the valley or up on a mountaintop. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. I love you, Greenbrier, and I'll see you tonight.